Now we're going to go over, uh, we're going to finish up domain 3.1, going over the different types of architecture models. So resilience. So the definition, this is the ability of a system or network to withstand and recover quickly from difficulties or challenges. So we're talking about cybersecurity resilience. We could be talking about things like load balancing. We could be talking about data replication. Backups. Also things like network aggregation. We could also be talking about RAID, right? For the cloud-based stuff, we could talk about different regions and zones that have the same data replicated across them, okay? So with cybersecurity resilience, we're planning for failures, right? Two is one, one is done. We want to make sure that we're also doing regular testing of our resilience. Does our load balancing actually work? Is the data actually replicated? Cost. So the financial consideration of implementing and maintaining security measures within a system. So sometimes, and this a lot of times depends on our organization's view of cybersecurity, how much cost is going to go in operationally and the capital cost to secure our systems, to have a highly secure enterprise that has good defense in depth. So we want to go over that cost to benefit analysis. And a lot of times this is also going to depend on the risk appetite of an organization. If our priority to the organization is to secure at all costs, make sure we're doing every single measure to secure, to prevent data breaches, well, it's going to be a high cost. And what's going to be the benefit, right? Something that we may have to do as a cybersecurity professional sitting in that SOC like director position. Responsiveness. So how responsive is our systems? This is the ability of a system to respond and adapt quickly to changes, including potential security threats. So a lot of times our responsiveness all depends on how we implement and what technologies we're using to secure our environments. So that could be things like SOAR, how we configure our SIEM on our endpoints, how we're doing our EDR or XDR, right? How quickly do we want to respond? Are we doing that behavior analysis? Are we looking and doing our vulnerability scannings, doing credentialed scans that maybe go in and automatically close ports for us? Is our monitoring and our alerts very robust? Are we categorizing when our on-call cybersecurity guy or network guy or IT guy needs to respond to something? So we just want to make sure we have well thought out and well tuned responsiveness. Scalability. So the capacity of a system to handle growth and increasing demands. So a lot of times guys with scalability, we have two different trains of thoughts. One is it on-prem, one is it in the cloud. If it's on-prem, do we want to invest in uh, server infrastructure where we're at 50% capacity, potentially wasting the business's money, right? That could be the thought process behind it. Or do we say, hey, we're on-prem, but we have peak seasons that we need to account for. So we want to vertically do scalability, meaning we're going to invest in a single node. I'm going to draw my data center rack here. With high storage, high compute, high network, but maybe in the summertime, we're at 50%. And then in the wintertime, during the holidays, we get an increased capacity that we can try to build some playbooks or run books to automate that increased scalability. That's vertical. We have horizontal scalability. This is typically going to be done in cloud environments where we're going to cluster, right? We're going to have individual nodes like right here to handle our summer months. And then when the retail season's high, we have our peak months. We're going to add these nodes to our cluster to increase our capacity. Okay. That's, Horizontal scalability. Ease of deployment. Is it simple and can we deploy systems and architecture with uh, speed, right? How easy it is. We want to remove all of our barriers to entry when it comes to deploying our architecture. And obviously we want to have automation as one of our key components here. Now let's go over some risk we want to think about. So. As an organization, how do we categorize risk? What's our risk appetite? If we don't have enough resources 
to mitigate or avoid risk. Maybe we think about risk transference, where we buy some cybersecurity insurance to mitigate the financial impact of security breaches or data loss. So that's outsourcing, risk transference. Ease of recovery. Do we have the proper systems in place, proper technologies to have run books and playbooks that recover our systems? Do we have good backups? Did we take good full and differential and incremental backups of our systems in case we fall victim to ransomware? How easy can we recover? Do our stakeholders, the people on our SOC and NOC and operations departments, IT operations, do they understand their role in recovering systems? Do we have enough training and drills in place throughout the year to make sure that we have ease of recovery? Patch availability. So are patches highly available in our enterprise? Are we reaching out straight to the internet? Are we having a closed off patching system? Do we have patch repositories that are maintained, okay? Are we doing regular vulnerability assessments to know when a patch is an emergency patch, highly needed, or can it wait? The inability to patch. So if we have legacy systems that don't have patches, what are we doing? Well, one, we have to conduct thorough risk assessment. We have to make sure that we're identifying the risk that legacy system poses to the business. And depending on our risk appetite and the business perspective and operations, do we then invest in compensating controls where maybe we harden? We put that in a closed off, isolated VLAN. We put host based firewalls. We do highly tuned uh, proactive measures that are never going to fix that vulnerability because the vendor is not patching. But are we doing proper monitoring? The proper things we can do to segment and protect systems that cannot be patched. And do we have a plan for migration? Do we have a plan to either lifecycle this or to put in that maintenance window where we'll have proper downtime to replace it? And part of that, do we have back out and rollout plans? Okay, power and compute requirements. So we have to consider the different power and computational resources needed for our operating and securing our systems, okay? Do we have too much? Do we have too little? Do we have efficient resource utilization? Do we overspend on our storage and our compute resources on-prem well, maybe we could have offloaded that to the cloud and save some money. Are we planning properly for our capacity? We want to plan for adequate computational and power capacities, okay? All right, let's go ahead and finish up this check on learning. And then we'll, oh. All right, let's do our check on learning quiz. So question one. What is the primary security implication of scalability in an architecture model? So A, scalable systems are inherently more secure as they can handle more load. Scalability does not affect security. It's not true. Scalability can introduce new vulnerabilities, possibly, right? Scalable systems are less likely to be targeted by attacks. No. It's going to be either A or C, okay? So I'm going to go with A here. Okay, scalability can introduce new vulnerabilities, especially when scaling out. All right, might be another one of those quizzes. All right, let me just bring up something over here. Okay, question two. What is the primary goal of building resilience into a security architecture? A, to ensure the system operates at peak performance. B, to guarantee absolute data privacy. So no, it's not going to be our resilience, right? C, to minimize the cost of infrastructure. It's actually going to increase the cost, right? Because we're going to have a lot of redundant systems. Or D, to enable the system to withstand and recover from disruptions. We're going to go with D, right? That is cybersecurity resilience, our ability to recover in case of failure. Question three, what does risk transference typically involve in the context of security architecture? So let's see. A, shifting the responsibility of risk management to automated systems. B, transferring the financial cost of a risk to another entity, such as through insurance. That's going to be it right there, right, guys? That's risk transference. Buying that cybersecurity insurance and offloading that risk, right? That's what risk transference is. Just remember that. 
for your studies. That is for uh, cybersecurity insurance. Question four, which of the following best describes the concept of availability in the context of security architecture? Okay, so A, the system's ability to scale up or down based on demand. B, the system's ability to withstand and recover from failures. Or C, the system's ability to be accessed and used as intended by authorized users. Or D, the system's ability to prevent unauthorized access. So we're going to go with C, the ability to, uh, the system's ability to be accessed and used as intended by authorized users. All right, question five. Which of the following best represents a common challenge when balancing cost and security in an architectural model? So let's take a look at our answers here. So A, higher security typically leads to lower operational costs. B, investing in advanced security measures always guarantee a positive return on investment. C, increased security measures can lead to increased complexity and higher costs. Or D, cost considerations are irrelevant. So we know it's not D, right? Cost considerations are not irrelevant. High security typically leads to lower operational costs. Of course, no, right? So B is not always true as well, right? Advanced security measures, a positive ROI, that all depends on the business, right? What they prioritize as a business. If they think higher security means they got a good ROI, but they're looking at just purely based off numbers, they probably won't see that, right? Because investing in an EDR, you don't see an ROI unless there would have been like a data breach that you had to owe money to, right? Does that make sense, guys? Like, it's kind of like health insurance. Is there a positive ROI on it? Well, if I go the whole year without getting hurt, then no, I just wasted a lot of money, right? But if I did, then it would have been. That's kind of like cybersecurity. We can do all of our defense and debt planning for cybersecurity. And if we don't get breached, some business leaders may look at that, like, why do we need this? Why do we spend so much on it? We don't need to worry about it. Right, that's kind of sometimes the the vibe, but no, our answer here is going to be C. Increased security measures can lead to increased complexity and higher cost. All right, C. What is a significant security concern when there is an inability to patch a system component? So A, the system's performance may degrade over time. B, the total cost of ownership of the system may decrease. No, that's not going to be it. C, the system may become more resilient to new threats. That's definitely not it, right? It becomes less resilient. Or D, the system may be vulnerable to known security exploits. So even though A may happen, right, just from the longevity, right, computing systems aren't meant to last forever. The significant security concern is that there's going to be an exploit that won't be able to patch, 